So there is still some uncertainty about what caused the rand to crash against global currencies, breaching the 19 rand mark last Thursday for the first time since 2020. Many economists and the business sector have attributed this to the ongoing load shedding crisis and South Africa's pressured relations with the United States. Now, the weakened currency performance is also expected to factor as the Reserve Bank, the South African <coughs> Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee, meets later this month to decide on an interest rate hike. Well, to find out what could have caused the RAND to take a dive, we are joined by Dr. Iraj Abidian, the Chief Economist at the Pan-African Investment Research Services. Always lovely having you. Thanks very, very much for being with us, uh, Dr. Abidian. Thank you very much, Leanne, and good morning to our viewers. So there is so much speculation about, you know, and, and, and I think one can say uncertainty about what has caused the RAND to weaken to the levels that it has against basically most global and major currencies last week. I mean, this, of course, creates a much bleaker economic outlook. So, you know, we've looked at other emerging market currencies and they're not really being affected. So what I'm assuming, and this is my sort of uneducated view, is we're just scoring own goals, aren't we? I mean, we, it looks like this has been caused completely internally by actions from, from what we're doing here in South Africa from government. Absolutely, Lian. Um, if the South African economy was a human body, think of it as a weak, sick, and affected body, then the, the slightest wind, the slightest breeze, the slightest uh, unfavorable situation send you back to bed. The South African economy for the past 15 years has been completely undermined and neglected. What do I mean by that? It's underpinnings, be it transportation, be it ports, be it energy, be it water, be it city management, have been completely undermined from the top of the government initially and then over the past few years through not commissioning but through omissioning. In other words, the, the cabinet just ignores, says the right thing but doesn't do anything about it. So in the global environment, investors look at the situation and say, okay, the South African economy from a structural point of view, its policies are not right, its infrastructure is crumbling, its energy is disrupted on a daily basis for 15 years, and the government can't get it right. Some basic stuff, mm -hmm. something that within two years maximum, 15 years ago, we should have sorted it out. Two presidents have come and gone. Three cabinets have come and gone. Nobody has managed to take it further. In fact, we've got more. We've now got from the heart of the cabinet, they don't know what's happening in ESCO. They contradict each other. They appoint CEOs themselves, and they sack them themselves, and they berate them themselves. So I think if you're sitting outside, this is the picture that you see. So in that environment, the last thing that you can afford in this economy that is growing at close to zero percent, its government debt is rising, its inflation is high, its interest rates is high, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the level of poverty and unemployment that is familiar to all of us. On top of it, then we get wrapped into the geopolitical, or we do not manage the geopolitical environment uh, wisely and, and competently. Yeah. So I think that's what happened. We left this American-Russian uh, Russian ship, Russian relationship, uh, which is neither here nor there. Yeah. Uh, we are not the only country in the emerging economies that's got similar type of uh, uh, neutral or somehow biased in one or other way. But the way we manage it, the, or we don't manage it, so to speak, or we leave it to chance, then makes the economy vulnerable. If it was a strong economy, we could weather it, we could manage it. But when we have a weak economy, when we have policies that are, as I just mentioned briefly, that the government says, not that you and I criticize, the president, President Ramaphosa has said our policies need to change, mm -hmm. new dawn new growth revival, none of that has happened. So yeah. I think that's where the, the investors are, are losing hope and confidence in the government that we will be able to do what it needs to be done. And by the way, what needs to be done are not complex stuff, they are basic stuff. And yet intentionally or out of incompetence, the cabinet doesn't do anything about it. 
Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about the leadership and let's talk about perhaps, you know, our, our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, for a moment. And one of the, the comments to come out over the weekend, and this was after the whole incident with um, Lady R and the Russian, you know, the Russian arms and whether South Africa sent weapons or not, after the U.S. ambassador said he would, bet, he, he would put his life out there to say it was a fact, this did happen. But, you know, there's been so much after that. Mbeki comes out, and I'm talking former President Thabo Mbeki, comes out and says the state has lost control. Who is mm. in control? A, a simple question like that. Who is in control of this country? That's exactly, Nian, what the foreign exchange and portfolio managers outside South Africa ask. They're saying who is in charge and why it's doing what it's doing. I mean, when a president comes and says, now I need a commission of inquiry to tell me whether my government has authorized and has shipped uh, weapons or not, that is a president who says, I'm not in charge. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's what it means. And maybe he doesn't know what he's conveying to the global capital markets, to the investors, to the average citizens. Maybe he doesn't connect the dots to use his uh, minister's uh, famous words. He must connect the dots. He must First, think before he uh, says things. When he appoints a commissioner of inquiry, he says, I'm the president, I'm the CEO of this company, but I don't know what's going on in my company, my own company. I don't know what my ministers do or don't. My heads of departments, including the head of defense and the head of security and the head of this and the head of that. Every time that he has to answer, he appoints a commissioner of inquiry. What does he tell the, the investment community internally and externally? To you and me as citizens. He says, I'm not in charge. Let's see somebody else can tell me what's going on. That is exactly Leanne, the question that the, that sends the, the, the market into a spin. At the, at the sort of the slightest wind of cold or rain, the investors are saying, when in doubt, chicken out, get out. If you look at the amount of disinvestment that has happened in our government and in the national bond, including government bond, is phenomenal. National Treasury knows the Minister of Finance must literally form or call for an emergency uh, cabinet meeting and the President must call the ministers to order. Why P investors are selling off because they say who is in charge? Yeah. And the, the best that the President can do is to say, OK, I'll appoint another commission of inquiry. Mm -hmm. I'll appoint another special emissary to do this and that. Yeah. So if that's the case, Mr. President, what are you doing? Yeah. And that's that. That's the question I think a lot of us are asking. If you had to rate exactly. him, if you had to rate him as a president so far, and this, I think, I mean, we need to do things like this, and we need to speak very openly. You know, since he's, we, we we came out of the Zuma years, and everybody thought, as you mentioned at the beginning, the hope that the president would bring with him. And I'm talking about President Ramaphosa. And here we mm. sit in what many would say a much worse off position than we ever were after all of the promises that have been made for us. How would you rate? Um, uh, uh, President Ramaphosa so far to date as the president of this country? You know, Leanne, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was uh, teaching at the university for 20 years. If he was my, one of my students, I would give him 10% and I would put him on notice. Get your next assignment right or go and for your own sake quit because you're wasting your time and my time. So I think that's what he has come to. And the business community is now, if you know, if, if you, most probably you do know, that over the past two months, at least three CEOs and chairmen of big listed entities have expressed the same thing and have appealed to government, stop diverting, focus on what you need to be doing. I'm referring to the CEO of FNB, the chairman of, of, uh, of Pick and Pay, Business Leadership South Africa. They are getting desperate because if it was a complex thing, we can understand, we can give the government time. But these are not uh, complex things. These are things that every average CEO on a daily basis has to deal with. And um, every managing director gets up in the morning and there is something that he has or she has to do. So that's the problem.
It is, and, and it's a major problem, and, and, and it's, it's, it's all of us that are feeling the repercussions of this. When you look at the unemployment rate in South Africa, when you look at the energy crisis in South Africa, when you look at the fact that the country has been grey-listed, and we cannot, um, we, we cannot underrate what a grey-listing actually means. When you look at the fact that, that we, we speak about one thing, about moving, you know, going to a greener, a cleaner energy transition, and then we see everybody disagreeing and people fighting and the CEO of ESCOM coming out and talking about what is actually going on behind the scenes, not naming names, but sort of giving ideas of, of what it is like to go into one of these entities to try and change things. And you, as you keep saying, it is not difficult to fix this. However, there are so many people at play here to get through, and perhaps it's the corruption at the center of it all that is causing us to just continue on this downward trajectory. Absolutely, Leanne. It's this green energy or green trans transition to green energy. Uh, we did, and as many others have done, that five years ago, we did projections that we could have created over 300,000 minimum, 300,000 jobs, if we'd done some very basic stuff. And yet, we've turned what would have been a fantastic creator of jobs and transformation of our economy, growing it. And I must put my head on the block without fear of contradiction that in the current situation, the South African economy should be growing more than four and a half percent if we had a competent government who did uh, what the government should be doing instead of fighting and, and, and uh, trying to protect the, the, the thieves and the corrupt. So that is the irony of it. And, and down, deep down, we know it as a nation. We've seen that other nations do it. But we become exasperated because what do you do? It's obvious that there is protection of corrupt and the incompetent instead of focusing on what needs to be done. And that's the problem that we face at the moment as a nation. Just very quickly, I mean, we've got one and a half minutes left, so I'm going to three, two, t throw two questions at the same time. D do you think the currency can turn around? I mean, is there any reason for the currency to turn around right now? I mean, we're looking at the current rate, 1913 against the US dollar. Obviously, it was the weekend and... Whew, a week is a very long time when it comes to seeing where that currency is going to go. And then interest rates, the decisions next week. Again, further hammering South Africans. Are we going to go higher? Is the Reserve Bank worried about that? Do they even care about the average South African? Their mandate is to protect the currency. Um, and that's what they say. And I don't think that they're too worried about anything else right now. So perhaps talk to us about those issues. Can we recover and interest rates going forward? Uh, can we? Yes, but it requires conditions. It requires the government, the cabinet, and we must be very careful not to talk government in general. The cabinet has to drop everything else and literally focus on the economy because hammering the Reserve Bank is not going to help. And then I, with respect, I don't agree with your point saying the Reserve Bank doesn't care about anything else. Their mandate is inflation. Inflation is about the poor. If they become reckless like Turkey and not respond to the re re inflation repressions, remember when they, every time that the RAND gets hammered, everything imported, diesel, everything else, fertilizer, food stuff, medicine, everything that we import becomes so much more expensive. If we don't get that under control, inflation, much like Turkey at 90%, hammers the poor more than anybody else, and it gets into a spin. So when we talk about Reserve Bank not caring, we must be very careful not to not see the consequences. Yes, high interest rates, I hate it, you hate it, everybody. But if you think that's bad, consider the alternative of not dealing with inflation. So can we turn it around? Of course we can. Remember Rand in, in, in uh, I think it was 2001, went even higher. But we got a few things done and within, <coughs> excuse me, within three months it got back. We can turn this economy around in 24 months if we do the right things, but not talk and do that. Dr. Bidian, we leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank talking to much. us. That was uh, Dr. Iraj Abidia, Chief Economist at the Pan-African Investment and Research Services, talking to us about a range of issues, but focusing mostly on the RAND's poor performance against major global currencies and uh, what could have caused it, and I think a few good reasons given there.